You're listening to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Satirius Johnson. Today, we're going to explore the many facets of West Hollywood, a Los Angeles County community with a rock and roll spirit. That's West Hollywood's Tommy Black, who over the years has performed alongside Scott Weiland and many others. He's also general manager of the legendary nightclub, The Viper Room, and later this episode, he'll tell us what he loves about the Sunset Strip. But first, the Sunset Marquee is known as the place where A-list actors and musicians stay, sometimes for years. Rod Gruendyke has been the general manager there for decades and tells us about a few of his more memorable encounters with stars like the pop-punk band Green Day. And I had a jacuzzi at the hotel, and they went out of their way to fill it up with bubble bath. And I came back the next morning, and I couldn't see my whole back garden area. It was full of bubbles. And I thought it was very funny. I didn't want to let the guys know. Made them go away for a month, and they came back a month and one day later, and they've been guests ever since. And starting with this episode, we'll be asking notable locals to take the California questionnaire. This recurring segment will kick off with David Cooley, owner and founder of West Hollywood's The Abbey, a gay bar with global renown. That's what's coming up on California Now. For decades, West Hollywood's Sunset Marquee has been the place A-listers go to enjoy a relaxing stay. The general manager there, Rod Gruendyke, takes pride in keeping so many famed musicians and actors coming back year after year. He also has a sizable collection of stories about the many very cool people he met on the job. And he's here to tell us a few. Welcome to California Now, Rod. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, Rod, I understand you've been with the Sunset Marquee for 31 years now. That's quite a run. When exactly did you realize you were working somewhere special? I think it started the first week at the Marquee when I was in my office and I had an unexpected visitor. and His name was Bono. He (laughs) came into my office and told me how special the hotel was to him and how special the employees were. And he made me promise not to have any of the employees depart during my tenure here. And if I did that, he would also leave the property. So it it was a very interesting opening day for me at the Marquee. Yeah, I can imagine. So you have this, 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 uh, you know, this superstar guy who basically is a regular there, and he comes into you and says, "Like, hey, look, you change anything, I'm out of here." Yep. We had another adventure with them later on when they were checking out of the hotel, and I was had my children with me. As I was kind of making sure everything was going smoothly, I looked over, and Bono was talking to my kids, and my kids <laughs> had no idea who he was, and they were probably you know, eight and ten years old, and thought he had a funny name. But years later, they realized how special of a moment that was. That's pretty amazing. Who, who are some of the other regulars who, who you know, stay at the Marquee? Well, during this early time, uh, again, my, my kids had to introduce me and tell me about Green Day. And I came over from a luxury product to this hotel. I wasn't handling a lot of rock and roll. So a lot of the bands were new to me. And my kids said, Dad, you're, you're pretty cool. You've got a band staying with you named Green Day. No idea who they were. <laughs> Went up and introduced myself and said, guys, congratulations on your success. And my kids tell me you guys are an amazing band. Talked to them for a little bit. And then the next morning, I had to talk to them again and asked them to leave the hotel for a year. Um, that <laughs> evening, they threw everything out the window off the third floor, TV sets, couches, armoires, everything. Oh, and wow. uh, wasn't happy about it. But it was funny because one year and one day later, they returned. And I <laughs> put them on the first floor of the hotel. And they thought that was funny. And Trey came in and dyed the carpet green. And they brought all the potted plants into the hotel. And I found oh, out wow. about the next day. And I asked the band to go away again and charge them for the, for the inconvenience. And uh, <laughs> they came back three months and one day later. And I had a jacuzzi at the hotel. And they went out of their way to fill it up with bubble bath. And I came back the next morning and I couldn't see my whole back garden area. It was full of bubbles. Oh, and my I gosh. thought it was very funny. I didn't want to let the guys know. Made them go away for a month. And they came back a month <laughs> and one day later. And they've been guests ever since. And they've become good friends. That is so funny. I mean, it sounds like, you know, with a lot of these folks, I mean, it could be, especially when they're young, 
you know, they're kind of rebellious rock and rollers and then they eventually kind of like grow out of that. But you have to be kind of like, all right, these are the rules. You can't act, you know, you can't act that way. And when I came in here, my whole goal was to kind of set the record straight and just want to make sure that people had a creative environment to work in and that they were safe. And I was trying to stop the knuckleheads from being knuckleheads. We had a lot of adventures the first couple of years of, of trying to get this to work, but eventually it did. The uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers were on our rooftop doing a filming, and I was sitting down doing an interview telling them that since I've been here, I've kind of calmed things down and, and the, the rockers kind of respect me and they're listening to me. And then I look up and I see the Red Hot Chili Peppers jumping off a rooftop. Oh my God. And I immediately <laughs> Just when you thought me. you had it under control. <laughs> yeah. and, and I immediately stopped and ran up to the roof and said, you know, what's going on? And they all were laughing. And a friend of theirs was across the way on a balcony filming the whole thing. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> you know, we, we should also note that, you know, when we say A-listers like to stay there, sometimes that's literally meant for years, plural. Uh, talk about that a little bit. We've had long-term guests on the music side, Phil Collins, you know, over 10 years, probably stayed six months of the year with us. Uh, Gloria Esteban, same thing, you know, for a 10 year period, at least six months wow. of the year. We've had, you know, back in the early days before I was here, John Lennon was a regular guest at the hotel. Hmm. Uh, Roger Waters, 30 years plus year at the hotel. Jeff Beck, 30 years plus year at the hotel. One of my favorite guests is Billy Bob Thornton. Billy lived here straight one time for four years. Then after that, he probably stayed with us maybe four or five months out of the year. Uh, Billy bought a house about two miles away, and he bought a house from Slash, and that's a funny story. <laughs> he would be working at Raleigh Studios, which is – we owned the studios at that time. Raleigh is our parent company, Raleigh Enterprises. Billy would show up at the hotel at midnight asking for his room key, and we'd say, Billy, you actually live two miles down the road now. You don't <laughs> live here at the hotel. He just said, I'm too tired to drive home. He gave me uh, a toothbrush and a comb. And, oh, that's funny. And he was happy. <laughs> I mean, at what point does somebody like Billy Bob Thornton, who's there for four years and then also just is in the neighborhood, basically, after that, I mean, at what point does he become like he changes from being a longtime guest to being, you know, an actual friend? Pretty much with Billy Bob from day one. He always introduces himself to people around the hotel as if you don't know who he is. Very humble <laughs> man. Very sweet man. Anytime we do it in events where it's a... Uh, charitable fundraiser or whatever it is he's always there to support it uh he goes on tv you know and he's been on tv saying he's the mayor of the sunset marquee on jimmy kimmel <laughs> we love him and he's a, a great guy we love his family and we have a long history with him uh same thing with billy Gibbons, and they're those two are friends and characters together mm, mm -hmm. well, why do you think so many a-listers love the sunset marquee so much i mean have you kind of like cracked the code in some way I think it goes back to day one, even before I was here. You know, they always felt safe. And we started out, the hotel started back in 1963 as a, you know, $18 a night hotel. We had kitchenettes in most of the rooms. And our entertainment people were mostly comedians from the mm. Troubadour and the Comedy Club. And it wasn't until later that we got the Ramones in. The Ramones started staying here and having kind of a beach party every day around the pool area. And then we start getting English bands in, and Jeff Beck brought the English groups down to the hotel. He was staying at the Riot House, which was the height at that time up on Sunset. And he was walking down out to Loma, and he wanted to get away. He felt that the American bands were kind of stealing the riffs and wanted something different. And he walked in the hotel, and he walked out in the gardens because, oh, my God, this is my new place, and went up and packed hmm. and came down. And then everybody else followed him. So the Bee Gees came down, and Led Zeppelin came down, and all the other English bands. Yeah. I mean, just to give people a sense of, of what the marquee is like, I mean, it's it's different than a typical hotel. It's kind of like this hidden oasis in the middle of West Hollywood. You've got like something like three and a half acres of villas and suites and all. I mean, it's, so it's really more of like a long stay property. It's set up that way. Yeah. People are, are shocked by it. You know, we're, we're we have a cul-de-sac now on the middle of the street on El Taloma. We're just below the Sunset Strip. Uh, we are three and a quarter acres here at the hotel, three different time periods. So the main building was, we opened in 1963. It was the first all suite hotel in the United States. We acquired land with, had apartments on them on Alta Loma. And these were, have become our larger villas. And each of the rooms are 1600 square feet. 
and there's hmm. 13 of these rooms in four different buildings. So our property line just kept moving up the hill. And mm-hmm. then in 1989, we acquired another acre and uh, we built 40 villas on it and did that in 2008. And so now we're on three and a quarter acres. We have these lush gardens. We're not a high rise you know, building block. We're spread out through beautiful gardens and koi fish pond. And people are shocked when they come to the hotel. They're thinking, oh, you're an older motel or apartment building. As they walk in and get further into the hotel, it just opens up. And all they say, oh, my God, we didn't know this was here. And this is beautiful. <laughs> and we have 400 trees and 2,000 plants. And people are just blown mm-hmm. away. I know also part of the guest experience um, of just walking around the Sunset Marquee is the photo collection there. What can you tell me about that? Back in 1994, I started my own collection for the hotel's archives. And I contacted a couple of friends, uh, Billy Givens and Dina Carter, and asked them if they would allow uh, Ross Halpin, our photographer that stays with us often, and he's a rock and roll photographer, if he could shoot them here at the hotel, if they liked the pictures, if they would make a comment on them. And so we had a, a special night here at the hotel, and Billy Givens drove up in a 1960s black Cadillac, and it was amazing, and got out and took pictures of him outside with his Cadillac, and we also went into the whiskey bar. And which is now bar 1200. And we, we kind of took pictures of him doing his usual thing of rolling dice in the bar and, and playing around. Uh, Dina Carter was in jeans and a t-shirt and, and looking very country. And my wife happened to be with me and we decided, my wife should say my wife decided she wanted to make her a little bit more sexy for a, a photo shoot. So I left the room and came back and she wrapped her in a sheet and looked very sexy when I returned and we shot her and came out some beautiful pictures. And we, hung them on the wall. And then Steven Tyler came through. We took a picture of Steven Tyler on the rooftop with the American flag. And that was a huge hit. And then just kept going to where I didn't have to ask artists anymore. They came to me and say, hey, how come my picture's not up at the hotel? (laughs) So when we're all said and done, I have about 110 pictures uh, done by three amazing photographers. And and even we have Robert Knight, Ross Halpin, Bob Gruen, Jim Marshall of the past he used to stay with us here, and I have some great Jim Marshall stories. Do you want to hear those later on? So that's where our photographer collection started. And then later on, probably about 10 years ago, we met with the Morrison Hotel Gallery people. And Timothy White, who's another amazing photographer, joined the Morrison Hotel Gallery. And they relocated their offices to our hotel in our lobby. And we replaced my art with their art. And so we hmm. do more of a current we have about 88 photographers representing the Morrison Hotel Gallery. We hang their art around the hotel, and it looks amazing. And then I have some special art that we put back up where we redid our Cavatina restaurant, and we we're putting up the art for it. I looked up, and one of our guests was coming down, and she had a picture for me, and it was Whoopi Goldberg. And mm. I took the picture and opened it up, and it was Whoopi sitting at John at Disney World. And she said, this actually happened. And she goes, well, I was sitting in the John going to the bathroom there. A young person put an autographs book underneath the door, wanted me to sign my autograph to it. So she goes, with your restaurant and with this new bar, I want my picture right next to the women's restroom. So we we hung it up there. And then about two weeks later, Billy Bob Thornton came in and said, hey, I want my picture up there next to the men's restroom. So he gave us a picture that Timothy White had taken of Bad Santa or he was unconscious uh-huh. lying by their urinals. So those are our two pictures that were given to us by celebrities to hang by our restaurant area. Oh, that is so amazing. I mean, it sounds like uh, these, you know, these celebrities who are fans of the marquee, they they feel like this place is a special place to them, that they just want to be a part of it. Yeah. It's, you know, we try to make it as safe as possible. And we, when we don't know, obviously no paparazzi are on the inside. We right. Paparazzi hang out on the outside, but we monitor that. We have security. We have cameras. You know, our guests can walk in. They don't feel like they're they're stuck inside their guest room. We have three and a quarter acres to walk around the property. Uh, they feel very safe that way. We take our guests also underground. So we have tour bus parking underground where the buses can come in. We close the gate with complete privacy to come up into the, the gardens and check in their rooms. So it's important for us that they do feel safe and they are creative. And what happens is when bands do their world tours, they usually end up stopping here, either coming back from Asia or going to Asia. And their families will meet them here at the hotel. 
they'll instead of taking one or two nights off, they'll take two weeks off and they'll recover. They'll spend time with their family. They'll go down to our studio to Nightbird Studio and put down some tracks. Uh, they'll work out in our new gym. You know, they'll, they'll get healthy again and kind of get things going straight and then go to the next part of their trip, next part of their tour. You know, you mentioned the the hotel restaurant Cavatina. Um, I've I've heard it's a, a spectacular meeting place. Um, is it also a celebrity magnet? It is. What we really strive to do is people understand that our guests are working here, and so uh, we really do again everything we can to make sure that they're not disturbed. But what I love about it is that our guests can come and they'll say, "I said, now how's everything going?" They said, "Fine. We were holding our three meetings in Cavatina Restaurant today, so that's great." I said, do you have any worries? He said, no, because no point. That person over was a cameraman of mine two, three years ago on this movie. And this person over here was my wardrobe person five years who's working on another movie. So they turn around, they know everybody around them. So there are a lot of people in the industry of all different genres here. It almost sounds to me like uh, what I imagined old Hollywood was like when people were going to the Brown Derby or whatever. It's like everybody knew each other. The celebrities were all there. And it's just like, it was just totally normal. Yeah, I came in on that. They really had created from the beginning, from the early 60s on through the 70s and 80s. There were some amazing time periods here of people meeting new people, doing new ventures with them, working on, on music, working on film. Um, Lisa Hagen was the director of marketing. She's the one that I knew before I came to the hotel. And she had all the studio contacts. And there was many books that were written here at the hotel Many stories were written for the Sunset Marquee. They were supposed to be shot here, like Get Shorty, but it never happened. It went to a different property. But all the different creatives of, you know, would hang out here, and they'll be sitting at one table, and all of a sudden they'll see somebody arrive at the hotel, and they'll stand up, introduce themselves, and they'll sit down and start talking about another venture. So the synergy <laughs> is amazing. Hmm. Do you have any kind of, I mean, I, I kind of feel like the restaurant might be kind of like almost like uh, like a neighborhood coffee shop or diner that, you know, you see somebody walking by like, hey, hang out. Why don't you like, have a seat and like, you know, let's have a cup of coffee together or something. Is it anything like that? Yeah. It, it, and it's come a long way. So beginning days, we had no restaurant here at the hotel. So everything was you order out and have it delivered or you go up to the Sunset Strip and bring it back down. Um, in the 80s, they put in a restaurant. They took one small guest from 529 square feet made into a kitchen and had a, a dining room, which was another guest room, which was another 529 square feet. And the main restaurant outdoor was around the pool area, in the main building. That's how it was when I came here. Um, in 2008, we built our first kitchen here at the hotel. So we have a beautiful kitchen. We built Cavatina and opened that in 2008. Uh, we're able to accommodate about 90 people sitting down. We have a beautiful indoor lounge area. We do events and parties here and so forth. And I think the neighbors were worried that, you know, they were so used to coming in and, and sitting by the pool that they weren't going to be allowed in anymore. I would say half of our guests are our local neighbors here that walk in. Uh, I've known them for years. I lived on the street for 14 years, so I know most of my neighbors here. So it, it, they're very comfortable. A lot of, and also a lot of my neighbors are in the entertainment business. And so it, they recognize people and have friends. And, you know, we had neighbor rates here. Their families come to town, they put them up at the hotel. So we're very close. And for years, when we put the whiskey bar in the hotel, one of the requirements was I had to wear a pager. That's what you had in those days. I had to respond <laughs> back to it seven days a week, 24 hours. So mm. I knew all my neighbors because they would call me to get on the whiskey bar list. They would call trying to get in the hotel or ask for favors. That's funny. I hear that Cavatina is kind of the place where I might actually spot Morrissey hanging out. Morrissey, longtime guest, and you, you could. So um, he's a dear friend, uh, very creative talent. Uh, we also had done a picture of Morrissey. We hang on the wall here at the hotel. And he just he's a special guest to us as well. Let's talk about the hotel pools for a minute. Are there any uh, stories that go off the deep end there? <laughs> well, we have two. So we're the only hotel in, in West Hollywood, in this whole area, probably of, of even Beverly Hills, that has two swimming pools. Um, they're, they're used, you know, very busy, especially during these days. One of my favorite stories of all is when Keith Richards lived here at the hotel, two different time periods, each time for about four months. And Keith was staying in, on the second floor of one of our villas. And he would come back from recording all night at about eight o'clock in the morning. 
and all the groupies were lined up around the pool and he'd wave to them and talk to them and say a few things. And then he would hang his cape outside the window. And that's how you knew that Keith was in house. <laughs> and he would turn his music up to make sure that everybody could hear it. And he threw a few t-shirts out to the girls. And uh, then he would cook. We put an oven in his room. A lot of our, we have eight rooms that have full kitchens, but this room didn't at the time. So we put an oven and refrigerator in there and Keith would cook him his steak and other food before he went to bed. When Keith checked in, we always charged him for the carpet because when he checked out, and I'm, this is serious, he had over a thousand cigarette burns in the carpet. So we would <laughs> wow. make him buy the carpet. Uh, back when we had the North, North Ridge earthquake back in the early 90s, uh, Keith was in house here at about four o'clock in the morning. He came down after the earthquake and we opened up the bar because everybody was scared. And Keith was doing shots behind the bar with people. So <laughs> that's my, my Bill of Pool story for up there. Oh, that is so funny. You know, it's, it, you know, the cigarette burns in the carpet expected the yes. cooking his own steak. Not so expected. Yeah. I played pool. I, it's funny because my wife calls me the squarest person she knows. But I'd been invited by Keith. I used to shoot pool with him at nighttime from about midnight till three or four o'clock in the morning, AMN records. And I could never understand the rules of the game of the pool because there'd be spaghetti and beer bottles and cigarettes and other stuff on top of the table. But I was always, I would always lose and whatever I did was wrong. So he always enjoyed inviting me. <laughs> That's funny. So, okay, so, you know, a collective EGOT's worth of talent and fame might be strolling through the lobby at any given moment, it sounds like. But tell me, when's the last time you were actually starstruck? Um, a couple times over the years. I think first was Paul Newman, a um, mm -hmm. you know, major celebrity, major artist, just a genius, uh, was doing a movie in Los Angeles and he checked in the hotel for three to four months. And I made the mistake because the travel people for him told me to have all of his products in the room. And he had a big villa, two bedroom villa with a kitchen. So we put all the Paul Newman products. And the first thing he did was he goes, take all this out. I don't want to see all this stuff. Wow. So we kind of we were kind of behind the eight ball to start to get them. <laughs> and then he called me over and said, uh, we're going to get this straight. He goes, there's four Paul Newman menus. And he says, I'm going to call you every day on the way home. And and I'll tell you, Paul Newman, number one, will be a cold Heineken <laughs> and a steak. Paul Newman, number two, will be a cold Heineken and a, and a salmon. Three would be a cold Heineken and a burger. And four would be something else. And every day, 20 minutes before he arrived, he'd call me up and say, Rod, you know, fire up Paul Newman, number one. Or fire up oh, Paul Newman, great. number two. <laughs> and we always had that cold Heineken waiting for him. His wife, Joanne, joined him a few times during his stay. And it was just amazing to see the love between the two of them. And we would just stand back in awe and watch those two together. And then I had another regular guest at the time was Gene Hackman. And hmm. Gene didn't know that Paul was in the hotel and vice versa. And I think Gene was already sitting down and, and Paul walked in and they started laughing. They sat down together and told stories for the next four hours. So it was a special time to see and, and to see that happen. The other special time was was really Jimmy Page. And it, and I, I love Billy Bob Thorne. I love a lot of my guests. I you know hundreds of these people I love. But Jimmy Page, I was a Led Zeppelin follower as a young age. Never mm -hmm. thought that I would meet any of the band here at the hotel. And I first met John Paul Jones, an uh, amazing person. And I met Robert Plant. But Jimmy Page uh, was doing a book tour. And at the end of the book tour, he was staying with us. He asked me if he could do a dinner at the hotel. I said, Jimmy, when we do a little dinner, and I'll pick up the tab for you and we'll make a special night for you. He says, great. He says, I'll probably have about 10 or 12 people. Well, the event ended up at 63 people. And <laughs> every day well, for the next four days, he kept calling me up and saying, you know what? I got to add two more. I got to add two more. I said, Jimmy, I don't have space. You know, who is this? He goes, oh, this guy, you know, you know, Ringo. Well, Ringo's coming in with Barbara. Okay, wait, we'll put Ringo on the list. Uh, next time it was Metallica. Next time it was Chris Cornell. So the oh, list. Man. Ended at 63. We had a special night. It was a memory that I'll never forget. I had two young men perform about 10 to 15 Led Zeppelin songs in a matter of four minutes. Just the little riffs from them. Mm -hmm. um, they were blown away. Jimmy was blown away. All the artists in the room were blown away. They stood up, gave the kids a standing ovation. Um, the, the two young men were Tyler Bryant, and the other one was Graham Whitford. Graham's the son of Brad Whitford of Aerosmith. Mm -hmm. Tyler Bryant has a band now called 
uh, Tyler Bryan, the shakedowns that Austin Graham plays in. I met Tyler through Robert Knight when he was 16 years old. We flew him out from Texas. He had never been out of his county before. And we we listened to him. We saw him on, on social media. We couldn't believe how, how well he played. Robert Knight was the contact. Robert Knight's the person that found him, brought him to the hotel. And Jeff Beck was at the hotel playing. And I said, Jeff, do you have a moment? Can you hear this kid? And just tell me if he's any good. And Jeff goes, okay, sure. So Jeff listened to him in the studio, walked down. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, Jeff. I didn't mean to waste your time. And Jeff goes, no. He goes, the kid's better than I was at this age. The kid's amazing. Hmm. Wow, and amazing. now you fast forward, the kid is now 25. He's open world tours for Jeff Beck, went on tour with him with his band. He's open for heart. He's done amazing. He's, they got albums out. They've toured with the best. So it's, it's another great story where we kind of got the roots of starting somebody and watch them to where they're now a, a big star. Yeah. I mean, I think what one of the attractions of the Sunset Marquee for people in, you know, the music biz or, or if they're actors is that it is a safe space. And, you know, they also feel like maybe there'll be like some sort of serendipitous coming together with, you know, like that, that, you know, story where Gene Hackman was there and they didn't know, you know, I mean, it sounds like it's the kind of a place where you can kind of like run into people in the same kind of creatives, whether they're celebrities or not. And so yeah. it's kind of like, you know, this is our place. It, you know, it happened with our studio. So Nightbird Studio had their, won their first Grammy and now they have over 200 Grammys downstairs. Yeah, I want to talk about your studio. So, yeah, so, so yeah. just to be clear, yeah. you guys have a state of the art recording studio on the property. I mean, yeah. that is just incredible. So, you know, in the middle of the night, somebody wants to go and record something, they can just go downstairs and do it. Yes. It's in relations. We have a relationship with a gentleman named Jed Lieber. And Jed is the son of Jerry Lieber, of Lieber and Stoller. Jed is a musician, songwriter, producer, does everything. We've met back in the early 90s and wanted an area to put his studio. We had a little, uh, isolation room. and We tried to make it work in a dentist. So we built a larger studio. We built the outside. Jed supplied all the equipment and did the furnishings inside and became a huge success. And we scored the movie Ocean Eleven in it. And hmm. the music was nominated for an Oscar with David Holmes, who was the, the musician for that. Uh, didn't win it, but it, being nominated was very special. Uh, we've done a total of 14 motion pictures down there, but Ocean Eleven was the largest. The celebrities, the artists that have used it is amazing. Um, and it's from, from R&B to country to classic rock, everybody from No U2, Aerosmith, to Carrie Underwood from country to Trey Songs to Cardi B to Chance the Rapper to Rihanna. Rihanna really would stay down there. The song went to number one hit. She played it on Jerry Lieber Steinway down in our studio and sung it down there. So there's a lot of special moments down there with the studio. So it is an attraction for our artists and it ties in with our rock and roll theme of the hotel. Mm. I mean, have, have there ever, ever been any kind of like impromptu coming together of folks who were just maybe having a drink upstairs and they're like, Hey, All let's just time. go downstairs. Really? All oh, that is so cool. Yeah. We've had from the beginning where CeeLo did a lot of music to some executives and the executives were not thrilled about it. He wrote the <laughs> FU song downstairs and that sold a billion <laughs> copies. Right. Wow. Um, We've had, you know, Rihanna was sitting in the restaurant and she was hearing an old Michael Bolton song overhead speakers. And she goes, oh, that's kind of interesting riff. I'd like to do something with them. And we said, Ashley, he's sitting next to you. So they got introduced and that night went down <laughs> to the studio and worked out something together. Amazing. And the list goes on. Jamie Foxx comes in here for one thing. And next thing you know, he sees an artist. And he's downstairs recording. Billy Bob Thornton is a musician as well, uses the studio down there. And he'll see somebody and say, hey. Gibbons, come on, I need a guitarist, come down here. Uh, Simon Phillips, I need a drummer, come on down here and join me. So <laughs> it, it, you never know what's going to happen. That is really cool. You could almost write a history of, I mean, that's almost like, um, you know, kind of like there are these famous studios all around the world where that are known for these collaborations and these, uh, you know, uh, these historic, iconic recordings. And like your studio is one of them, sounds like it. And it's not only down the studio, we've done some musical events above up in our pool areas uh we used to do live performances where we tried to introduce new artists to to the industry and hopefully they could sign we did that for a number of years uh at our 50th anniversary i was going to have jimmy page and jeff beck perform for us at the hotel but jeff got called away for the olympics and had to do a, a presentation down in china so uh we went to plan b and plan b was not a bad one so we 
got contacted to Stevie Wonder through a friend of mine. And <laughs> I met Stevie Wonder probably 20 years earlier. And I told him what situation I was in. And he said, I'll come there and be at your event. And um, I had John Oates, Apollo Oates in the hotel. Billy huh. Lee Gibbons was on tour and Billy came back and we put a band together and uh, performed. And Stevie Wonder showed up at 930 and performed. And it was amazing. And, That's uh, unbelievable. It was a special night. And since then, yeah. we've had Miley Cyrus and Steven Tyler and a lot of other people. Well, how often do you have live music at the property? Well, COVID was a damper. So we had it every month for about five years before 2020. And then we stopped it. And we're still kind of hesitant in doing it again. But we plan on starting to back up in January of 2023 if everything goes well. And we'll continue with it on a monthly basis. That sounds great. Now, Bar 1200, just off your hotel's lobby, is is kind of like a, a clubby, speakeasy vibe. Um, what makes it so special? Well, it started back when I came to the hotel. There was a bar there that sat six people. And Bruce Springsteen and was a regular there and Phil Collins and so forth. And my office was the second half of what now is the bar. And when I came to the hotel, really nobody was really packing the bar. We had a piano in the lobby. I heard the stories back in the 60s and 70s where Elton John would come back at night and play our piano, but nothing was really happening there in the 90s. So I removed the piano, uh, met Randy Gerber in New York, saw what he was doing with smaller clubs and said, let's see if we can do something together. And so we hired Randy as a consultant and we opened the first West Coast Whiskey Bar uh, in 1994. And it was the most successful bar per square footage for revenue in California for about the first five years. Hmm. Uh, Randy opened up a second facility at the Mondrian later on called Sky Bar. Took a lot of pressure off of us. And then Randy started doing things with Starwood Hotels. And we did not want to be associated with another hotel. So that's when we parted our way with Randy in 2005. And that's when Whiskey Bar turned over to be the Bar 1200. But in the course of all these years, the employees were ours. We ran the operation. Randy was just a consultant. We got the name of the whiskeys, which we changed to Bar 1200, and mm -hmm. it was business as usual for us. So we play you know, classic rock and roll music. Guests are, are able to come in the early time periods and put their, give us their music that, that they want to hear. We also can rent it out privately. We've done a lot of the events, especially during Grammy times. Green Day's done a lot of the events in Bar 1200. And we tied in with our studio. So you can be working in the studio and watching what's going on with uh, events up in the Bar 1200 area and vice versa to where we can do a listening party where a person's performing downstairs and we can hear it upstairs in Bar 1200. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the history of the hotel. Let's turn now to the future. Uh, looking into the crystal ball, what does the future hold for the Sunset Marquee? Well, George, is the owner is 91 and still active in the company, but he's passed his baton to his son, Mark Rosenthal. Mark's you know, one of the owners of the hotel. And he's the president of the company. And Mark's direction now, we're spending a lot of money doing a lot of renovations. So we just completed a $7 million renovation in, in 2021. Uh, we redid all 40 of our new villas, and we completely redid our Cavatina restaurant. We are this year going to be doing a couple of our older villas. We have four of the older villas that were built in the 1930s and 40s. We've completed one. We're going to be doing a second one this year and then two next year. And then at the end of 2023, going into 2024, we'll put the main building, completely redo the main building of the hotel. So we'll probably be spending at that time another $10 million. So Mark wants to get back into the property. He wants to make everything perfect. We want to be a luxury brand in the middle of West Hollywood with these beautiful gardens. We've completed a new gym. We always had a little gym here at the hotel. We were partnered with Equinox across the street where all our guests can use Equinox to work out on. But we wanted our own workout facility. So we have a new room that we just opened. It's beautiful. It's downstairs. And also our guests will be able to, to rent it out privately if they want to go down there and be just by themselves with their own team. That's something new and different. But you'll see continuing upgrades for the next three years at the hotel. It'll be something special to see. Yeah. What, so what's kind of like the overarching goal of all those renovations? Is to be current with technology. I guess that's one thing. To make sure also, you know, when things were built in the 1960s, they weren't as thick as they were 
in current times with the regulations. So we're doing a lot of soundproofing, a lot of new windows and, and new things like that. We're adding additional security elements into the hotel. The majority of it is, is upgrade of technology throughout the property. Absolutely. I mean, your kids must think you have the coolest job in the world. <laughs> yeah, it's they're they're stunned to think who I know. And when I when people come up to them and say your dad's pretty cool or you should be happy that you've got a father like you have, my kids are just in shock. They tell <laughs> you know this person. I say, yeah, I actually know this person. Or I'll get phone calls at home. That's incredible. You know, Rod, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining us on California Now. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Rod Gruendike is general manager at the Sunset Marquee in West Hollywood, online at sunsetmarquee.com. This is California Now. Up next, our California questionnaire segment with David Cooley. He's the owner and founder of West Hollywood's The Abbey, a world-renowned gay bar that first opened its doors in 1991. The California Questionnaire is a brief survey designed to unlock what residents love about living in the Golden State. Longtime listeners will recall it first appeared on the show when I interviewed Kevin Costner last year. This time around, we thought it would be fun to have David narrate his way through the questionnaire himself, sort of documentary style. Enjoy. Hi, this is David Cooley, the owner and founder of the world-famous The Abbey in West Hollywood, and glad to be speaking for the California Questionnaire today. What is the biggest misperception of Californians? Hmm. One, of course, we don't know how to drive in the rain. Two, that it's very hard to meet people. I would say that's all wrong. I would say Californians are really friendly. What is the stereotype that holds most true for Californians? I would say the weather. You know, we don't we don't have the big heavy coats to change our snow tires. On Christmas Day, we're in tank tops. We're very, very casual for business meetings. Um, we love our In-N-Out burgers. We love the beach. We love our sunsets. And we love our pool parties. My greatest California love, I would, I hope this doesn't sound too corny, but I would really have to say my Hollywood dream from Ohio was not to be in the Hollywood business as we all know it. I don't have the talent to be an actor or a director or a writer, but I did have the dream and ambition to open up a bar, uh, especially in West Hollywood, because that's what brought me into Los Angeles, feeling accepted there. And I wanted to open a bar that could be outside and not behind closed doors. So when I see so many people coming in and I have so many of my employees that are one decade, two decades, or some even going on 30 years there to create that atmosphere and to see everyone having a great time uh, and enjoying our dancers, our music, our DJs, our drag shows, our food, and our world famous cocktails, that's my Oscar. I got it. And, and that's when I'm so happy. What is my favorite Golden State splurge? Here in Southern California, we have a, wonder, a lot of places to go shopping sprees, depending on what kind of shopping we're talking about. If we're talking about food shopping, I always love to go to the farmer's market. If you went looking for designer wear, there's always the famous Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Um, but the, we have great shops off of Melrose, um, on Sunset. We're seeing a lot of new designers come in. I'm still pretty much a t-shirt and jean guy. I do love my, my shoes. And of course we have wonderful places where you could go to one location and try food from all types of regions around the world. The road trip, I would probably say Palm Springs. And I love it there because it's a whole different energy. It's a whole different type of architecture. Of course, you have the heat, but you have cool evenings, and I have my 92-year-old father there. I'm going to reflect back just on last weekend. I went and I drove my car up the coast, and something being in California, I've always wanted to do, and I didn't. And I drove myself up there and stopped at the Little Beaches and Hearst Castle and San Luis Obispo, and it was one of my California dreams that I, I kind of finally fulfilled. 
But my favorite culinary experience is when I'm in a friend's kitchen and we're all making our own different dish and we all share it. We have it really good here. You know, we, we eat fresh. And that's why everyone thinks in California we're all beautiful and toned and blonde. <laughs> um, the best California song, I always refer back to the Eagles, Hotel California. It was my first concert in Ohio. So I would have to say, just of the words in the title, Hotel California. My favorite California dream day would unfold probably with me checking in on the business, driving up the coast to Malibu, meeting some friends for lunch, and going back to the house and having a bottle of wine and watching the sunset. This is David Cooley, the owner and founder of The Abbey in West Hollywood, and you've been listening to The California Questionnaire. Again, that was David Cooley, owner of The Abbey. You can find dozens of California questionnaires on our website, including surveys filled out by Jimmy Kimmel, Alice Waters, Tracy Ellis Ross, and even yours truly. That's right, I took the questionnaire too. It's all waiting for you at visitcalifornia.com. Up next is our musical guest, West Hollywood fixture Tommy Black, whose song Summer Took Me was featured at the top of this episode. Let's hear a little bit more of it before I talk to Tommy. Again, Tommy Black playing the song Summer Took Me. Tommy happens to be the general manager of The Viper Room, a nightclub in the heart of West Hollywood's Sunset Strip. For a certain subset of music fans, venues like The Viper Room and others nearby like Whiskey A Go Go, The Roxy Theater, and so on, hold almost mythical status. Tommy knows the strip well, having played many shows there since first arriving during the rock and roll gold rush era of Guns N' Roses. And he's even toured with musicians including Scott Weiland. Welcome to California Now, Tommy. Hi, Satiris. I'm so glad to have you on the show today. Yes, yes. Nice to meet you. Glad to be on the show. So, Tommy, let's start with that song we just heard, Summer Took Me. What inspired it? I wrote it in Los Angeles, and it's a, it, was a, it was a special time, uh, I don't know, just playing with another band, and you, you have outlets. When, you, when you're recording with other bands, sometimes it makes you more creative. Even when you're writing with them, you, you write more of your own stuff. So I don't know. It just got inspired by just being in motion musically with, with some, other, some other cats. And, you know, it's a special song to me. Have you performed uh, this particular song on any Sunset Strip stages or even at the Viper Room? Yeah, definitely at the Viper Room. And, um, you know, a few, uh, let's see, where else? I maybe, not, not just the Viper Room on Sunset Strip, but definitely many other clubs and, and many times at the Viper Room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Would you say there's there's a mystique about seeing live music or, or performing live music on this stretch of real estate right there on the strip? Yeah, there's there's like a certain energy on the streets. I mean, like that area. Uh, first of all, the club sounds really good. The Viper Room. Uh, it's, it's it's like a little, you know, an intimate little venue where you can see a big band. You know, it's like a little jewel box. And yeah. um, the vibe of that street, you know, in West Hollywood, the vibe, you could you could feel the energy. You could just feel it. So is the Sunset Strip kind of still a bucket list destination for up and coming musicians today? Yeah, and tourists. And I mean, people come in all the time. They're excited about the venues, you know, there. We had Youngblood last week. You know, kids were waiting three days out front in line for Youngblood. Hmm. He played <laughs> he, he, and he actually played Viper, Roxy and Whiskey. He did three shows. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and one in one day, you know, he did three shows. Oh, he, amazing. He ran from club to club. So, I mean, 
there's that that's like a really cool thing and he's you know a new a new up and coming or new doing it you know kind of guy so i don't know it, it's still relevant and it's still very cool you know yeah it sounds it so you know, as a music fan yourself um what would you say was the most memorable show you've seen in west hollywood hmm must i mean hmm okay one time uh lucas nelson was playing at viper and willie nelson got up and started jamming with him and then <laughs> They did some songs, and then Woody Harrelson got up and jammed with the two of them. Oh, you know my I mean? God. That's hilarious. Yeah. So it's just like stuff like that. Or you see, you know, Urge Overkill was playing, and Jack Black was uh, playing tambourine for him. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it was just weird, memorable story, uh, uh, memorable shows. Let me think of any others. Uh, Elvis Costello there. I mean, everyone's played there, you know, but... I could go through a laundry list of things I've seen, you know, from Pussycat Dolls days with Scarlett Johansson up to, you huh. know, current stuff, you know? I mean, you name it, um, it could be touched on. <laughs> wow. Well, Tommy, this has been really great. Thanks so much for joining us on California Now. Thank you so much, Asterius. That, that, that was awesome. Thank you for your time. Tommy Black is general manager of The Viper Room online at theviperroom.com and on Instagram at The Viper Room. Let's go out now with a little more of Summer Took Me. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. We hope to see you in the Golden State soon. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find our show on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're in trip planning mode, be sure to check out the California Now blog. It's the perfect companion to the conversations you just heard on this podcast. You'll find timely and topical trend stories, the latest updates and local events, and much more. It's all at visitcalifornia.com slash now. That's visitcalifornia.com slash now.